I head up the EMEA cross-border capital markets team at Colliers. Um, I'm based in London. Um, I'm a central cost to all the capital markets teams, and I sort of value add them all with my knowledge of international capital and access to them. Um, as Richard mentioned, I'm often on planes to, to Asia uh, and to North America and South Africa now, maybe. Um, so really, I have a good insight of what these guys are thinking. But um, we've just heard about investors are all very different. And I think the easiest way to do this is to categorize them um, in, 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 in types of investor. And there's, there's really sort of six types. And I really sort of concentrate on the sovereign wealth funds, the, the global insurance companies and pension funds, uh, the private equity funds, um, the family offices, the sort of REITs, uh, and then finally the sort of big investment managers. And I'll just quickly go through what these guys are thinking, what they're doing, and some names uh, of some of these parties. Right, so, so I thought we might as well start with the sovereign wealth fund. So um, I'm sure everyone knows what a sovereign wealth fund is, but uh, they're effectively investing the wealth of each country uh, that they're from. Um, the biggest one in the world is, is Norge, uh, which is the big oil fund in, in Norway. Um, obviously, they're European, so they, they have access, they can get round uh, and look at new markets uh, continually, but they're also heavily investing in Asia, in North America as well. Um, the two um, on the left, um, which I think everyone's heard of recently, is uh, the first one is CIC, which is the China Investment Corporation, who've obviously just bought Logical. Uh, GIC uh, is the big uh, Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund, who also bought P3. So these guys, you can kind of see, um, they like quantum. Uh, they have very core, safe strategies because of who they are. Um, they quite often invest indirectly um, and quite favor co-investments with large investment managers. So they've invested with the likes of a Heinz or a Tishman Speyer or a Brookfield, uh, those sort of names. Um, obviously, the Middle East, they've been around for ages, the Adias, the QIAs. Um, but you know they, they really like scale, and um, they often have local teams in Europe, which is very, very key because a lot of this Asian capital doesn't have local teams, which means it can't really go and access new markets. Um, but they will set up, and quite often the trend is once the big sovereign wealth fund has gone into a new market or, or bought um, into a new sector, then uh, the rest of the country's wealth, the, the, the insurance companies, the family offices, uh, the REITs generally follow. So, so I think once they've bought, you know, as we've seen with Logicor and uh, and P3, and with a lot of assets in this region, it will, it's very encouraging for you guys that hopefully some of the other money will follow. Um, then, then it's really the next uh, type of investor is the global insurance companies, pension funds, and I sort of class Chinese state-owned enterprises in this as well. And um, the, the global insurance companies are, are generally coming from uh, North America, from Asia, um, and you know the first one on the on uh, at the top uh, left is Ambang, which is uh, one of the large Chinese insurance companies. Um, Ambang have cleverly gone and bought a Dutch uh, insurance company and a Belgian insurance company, and they're using that as their platform for Europe. So the first deals they've done was 500 mil of offices off Blackstone in the Netherlands, and I think they've just bought uh, the DoubleTree Hotel. Um, in, in, in the Netherlands as well. So these guys, now they've got local offices, they're, they're sticking to the markets where they feel they've got uh, local expertise, uh, but they are starting to, to venture out. I mean, to give you the sort of scale, they bought the Wardorf Astoria um, Hotel in New York last year for about 2.3 billion, so they can really spend a lot of money uh, like the sovereign wealth funds. Um, I mean, sticking on some of these Asian uh, insurance companies, we've got EPF, uh, which is the Employers Provident Fund from uh, Malaysia. Um, they were the first sort of Asian insurance company that came over to Europe, had great success in London, buying in 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, unlike Ambang, who are trying to do it all themselves, uh, EPF will go through an investment manager. Uh, and I'll come on to those investment managers later, but they're very important for this region. Um, but they, they've used the likes of CBRE Global Investors, they've used uh, Deutsche, um, and they've used Savills uh, Investment Management. And 
you know, these guys, I mean, I, I know that, for example, they own a couple of retail blocks with a Danish pension fund and a Dutch pension fund actually in Warsaw. So they are here, but you may not have heard uh, that they were here because they're not doing it directly. Um, Australian super, uh, there's a lot of money coming out of Australia again. Uh, they very like retail, um, a lot of them buy shopping centres, um, and I think um, they have been sort of having a look again with, through investment managers here. Uh, they generally use TH real estate uh, for most of their access in Europe, um, and you know they bought into the King's Cross scheme uh, heavily in London. Um, and then the, the South Koreans, so we've got Samsung, Hyundai, um, there's a lot of money, and we've just heard that South Korea's weightings is, is going up um, considerably to real estate. And these guys are probably having the most success in Europe out of all the Asians. And, and the reason for that is they, they go through what they call a local asset management company, and there's about 19 of those in, based in Seoul. And those guys are cleverly using an investment manager in Europe, which is giving them access to new markets, understanding the buying processes in each market, getting over language barriers. Um, and you know, we, we've obviously saw GLL come in and buy a couple of Amazon sheds for some South Koreans in this region last year. But they're having great success in the likes of Germany, France, UK, uh, and Benelux at the moment. And I think um, you know, they are a really good source of capital to come. Um, and then just, just finally really talking about uh, the Canadian pension funds. Um, so HOOP is the Healthcare of Ontario pension plan, uh, and AIMCO is the Alberta Investment Management Corporation. Um, these guys, they've set up offices uh, in London, or well, HOOP are about to set up an office in London. Um, their cost of the capital is slightly different. You'll see the, the Asian insurance companies are very core buyers, paying record yields in, in quite a lot of markets. These guys, being North American, their cost of the capital is slightly higher. Um, they're very into going into strategic uh, joint ventures, um, so quite a lot of the Canadians have all teamed up with some logistics partner, so Hoop, I think, are with Verdian, which is the ex-Helios lot, um, AIMCO have teamed up with Oxenwood in the UK, PSP are with Seagro, uh, for example. Um, so their strategy is a bit more core plus rather than core. Um, and I, and the, the final one over there is the, the CEFC, which are the people who came into Prague last year. And I think that's quite an important point, that the, the Asian capital that's coming to this region, unless it's with a local IM, isn't really going to get to this region very quickly. And um, I'll, I'll come on to some of the reasons why. But CEFC came in because they've got business interests um, here. Um, I, I'm introducing our Central and Eastern European team to a Japanese client in London on Monday. Uh, and they're very keen to enter this region because they've got business interests in here. So I think don't, don't rely on the Asian capital coming. The people who do it on their own, like the Chinese, like uh, the Singaporean capital, probably won't get here as quickly as we all expect. But the people who are using the local investment managers should be here, uh, already here, and, and, and are on their way. Um, then the sort of private equity funds. Um, I think um, some of these names are quite well known, but um, these guys are obviously completely different to the two types that I've just talked about. Um, their, their cost of capital is a lot higher. Um, their, their whole periods are a lot shorter. Uh, they're trying to run into markets buy value-add distressed assets, which they can reposition, asset manage, and turn around and sell to the first two lots if they can. Um, you know, it, it, the trouble I think some of these guys have had with uh, entering this market is there hasn't been as much distress here as there has been in Western Europe. Um, so, you know, they've been buying off the bad bank from Ireland all over the UK, um, buying lots of non-performing loan portfolios trying to get into the likes of Italy. So they have been favoring, I mean, obviously, they've had great success over here, but they've had probably more success in Western Europe. Um, but I, I suppose what's, what's interesting about all these guys now is as we're at this mature part of the property cycle, a lot of their capital is what they're calling going more core plus. So I think everyone thinks that they want up to 20% returns, geared returns, uh, but quite often now their, their money 
uh, is only requiring sort of low team returns. And, and Starwood, for example, you know, they've raised 600 million to gear up for Europe, uh, which only requires an 8% return. So, you know, their investors are, at this mature part of the cycle are sort of moving away from risk uh, and wanting to go into more sort of core plus strategies. Um, then um, the fourth type of capital is the family offices. I mean, this is the, the new name for, for private investors. Um, I mean, there's so many of them around the world. They're not making money in the bank in this low interest rate environment. A lot of them are going into, uh, into real estate. But, you know, it, 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 it can be quite frustrating working with some of them. You know, it's, uh, am I going to buy my super yacht or am I going to buy property this week? Um, so um, they, they can be a bit frustrating to work with. I've just named some of the big players. So Ponte Gadea, um, if you haven't heard of, is Amancio Ortega, uh, who, who's the Spanish retailer who owns the likes of Zara. Um, Chinese Estates is, is, is a very wealthy billionaire from, from Hong Kong. Pembroke is the, the Johnson family from the US. Uh, Safra Sarazen, they're based, uh, they're originally from the Middle East, were big financiers, were in Brazil, now in New York. Um, and, and Ramsbury is again another retailer, Stefan Persson from, uh, um, from Sweden. Now, their firepower can be extraordinary sometimes. So, you know, we've, we've just seen a Chinese billionaire spend 1.3 billion on the cheese grater in London. Ponte Gadir regularly spend 500 million plus uh, on assets. And Safra Sarazen, so Joseph Safra, you know, went and bought the gherkin in London. So some of these guys will spend a lot of money when the timing's right. Um, and there's so many of these, these family office money from the Middle East that's targeting the whole region as well. Uh, a lot of the shape money, we're seeing quite a bit of money coming out of Saudi at the moment because of the oil. Uh, and Qatar recently uh, being associated with terrorism potentially. So um, I think there's a, a lot of that capital coming over at the moment. Um, and then the, 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 the fifth type um, was really what I call the sort of cash rich developers and the global REITs. Um, the global REITs uh, are sort of being driven because um, to diversify because maybe there's not enough scale in their markets, the pricing's too hot, and you know we've seen quite a bit of this Canadian REIT money. So Dream Global, uh, which is the old Dundee uh, REIT, Slate Properties, again from, from Canada. I've listed quite a few South Africans here. Um, and I'm going to go on in, in a bit more detail onto the South African capital um, shortly. Uh, but there are REITs from Hong Kong, New Century Real Estate. You know, they're looking all over the region, preferably trying to get 6% plus. So this reg region ticks a lot of boxes. And then Hobie Land's a great example of a Singapore cash-rich developer. Um, you know, they, they've, they've gone and developed a lot of residential, a lot of offices in their own markets, sold it all to the Chinese who are diversifying, for example, into Singapore. Uh, and they've got all this money, but their markets are so expensive, they can't justify buying. So they're uh, over, over in Europe, and they've had some great success in, in London, the UK, and uh, are starting to look at continental Europe. Um, and then finally, the last uh, lot is the, what I call the global investment managers. Um, and, and these guys are the really important guys for your region, because I mentioned earlier, they I have a lot of what they call separate accounts, um, non-discretionary mandates, and they're quite acting like agents, actually. I, I keep telling our teams that we're whining and dining these guys, but quite often there are competitors. Um, but um, yeah, these are the guys that can get the new money into your markets because they, they, they have the local expertise, they understand the buying processes, um, and they understand the market dynamics. And uh, you know, um, they're very, very important. As I said, GLL bought South Koreans in, CBRE Global have bought Malaysian money into this market. Um, you know, AEW uh, have mandates with Q Super from, from Australia, uh, the Texas Retirement System from, from uh, the US. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's very important to uh, get over these guys uh, for your market. Um, 
I just wanted to just touch on when I've been having meetings, conversations with quite a lot of this international capital, some of the issues that have been raised. I mean, a lot of these issues, um, I'm not trying to be negative, but they've been raised, and I know a lot of them are being, um, being addressed. But um, the first one is, and this really goes to, to, to the Asian capital that um, I mentioned, they've got very, very small teams, even though they've got so much money they've got very small teams, which basically means they can't go and learn new markets. So they've come over, they understand London, it's the kudos of owning in London, um, and um, they, they get that. But some of them who are trying to do it on their own, uh, which is quite often the, the Chinese, the Hong Kong, and the Singaporeans, um, just, just don't have the ability to come here. So even if you can sit there and say, you should be buying offices in Budapest, for example, there's a really good story there. They just won't do it because they just don't understand the market. Um, you know, generally, quite often, some of them will set up small offices in Europe, but um, very few do, and I think that's a, a real issue for uh, w which markets these guys can look in. Um, the gateway cities, um, they're, they're, they're looking at the gateway cities. They always look at capital cities. Um, you know, it's, it's really only been London, it's been Paris and France. Even in Germany, even though they, they're renowned for having seven cities, a lot of the international capital will only consider Berlin, Frankfurt and Munich, so it won't consider the others. And I know in Poland that we're talking, there's quite a number of good cities here, but I think if they came, uh, this type of capital, it probably would be looking at just Warsaw at first, maybe going into other markets if, it, if they understand it. Um, we just heard about um, some of them like funding to funds, um, others don't. Uh, the Asians love to be in control. I think uh, the one lesson everyone's learned since the global financial crisis is I don't necessarily want my money into a fund and can't control the exit. So um, some of them like it, some of them don't. Um, some of the uh, US money, North American money I've, I've looked at has been preferring Western Europe, as I said, because it's had a bit more distress. There's not as much development going on there. So I think people with a higher cost of capital, like the private equity funds, some of the Canadian pension funds, you know, when they come and they see opportunities in, in, in the markets over here, they generally seem to, seem to be quite core opportunities, um, which, which isn't ticking the box, where they can go into Italy or the Netherlands and find something that they can reposition. Um, access by flights, it's, it, it's really, really important for the Asians. Um, it puts your city on a map. Um, so we, we had, uh, I think it was three years ago, Manchester in the UK decided to do direct flights to Beijing. And within two months, uh, one of the big Beijing state-owned enterprises came over and invested 800 million into a business park by Manchester Airport. Um, you know, these guys will fly to London. They can get five flights a day. It, it's easy for these guys. They, they understand it. And, uh, you know, I've been in meetings in Asia with a colleague in Berlin. And the chap said, can I fly direct to Berlin? No. Well, I'm not going to invest in Berlin then. So, so if you can improve infrastructure over here and get them um, direct flights to the likes of Beijing and uh, Shanghai, it, it really does improve it and puts uh, the cities on the map. Finance costs, I know these are always improving, um, but you know it's one of the first questions the, the, the global private equity funds ask is, are the local banks lending? Um, and um, you know quite often the Asian mentality um, investing in Europe is, is looking at the finance costs of a country and then adding about 250, 300 basis points. It's as simple as that. So in the UK, we, we have relatively high finance costs at two and a half, so they, they want to come in and pay 5% plus, um, just to reflect the risk. Whereas in Germany and France, the finance costs are half of that, so they might come in and pay 4%. Very simple. The legal and tax transparency has always been um, an issue to some investors. It's more of an educational thing. Um, and then I, I just want to talk on this exit strategy, because I was talking to, to, to Richard the other day, and um, I think a lot of these investors, what they want to see is is who are the local buyers? Who are the local people? Because when they're considering their exit strategies, if they feel that they're not relying on international money to exit, and, and there is local in institutional money or local REITs, um, they feel a lot more 
comfortable to enter that market. So, um, you know, it, it's encouraging that Hungary's got quite a few uh, local institutions, Czech's got quite a few, and I think if, if Poland does go down this REIT uh, um, route, then, uh, then I think that would be really encouraging for a lot and give a lot more comfort for these guys uh, to come in because they think they're not just relying on a smaller window and relying on international capital to buy it if the world goes upside down. Contingency, um, you know, I, I, I've had examples of investors who've gone into development into Romania, for example, and, and, and they put 10% contingency in and sometimes wish they put 20% uh, down. Um, it has been an issue. I think it's improving. Uh, you know, in the past, there's been a bit of corruption. The mayor always asking for an extra load of money that they hadn't accounted for if they want to change anything. And then the political uncertainty. Um, that's a big issue for, for, for these guys uh, entering new markets, and uh, that's what's deterring quite a few of them from the UK at the moment. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's encouraging. I think uh, Orban in Hungary uh, is, is coming more predictable. Um, so I think there's a lot more money going to go into, into Hungary. Um, I know there's a bit of uncertainty going on in Poland at the moment, but it seems to be more of a pricing issue, I think, to get around it. And of course, you know, in Czech Republic, um, the, the politics is very safe. And, uh, you know, when you have safe politics, it does courage, encourage investment. Um, so, just, just to quickly touch on some of the uh, investment volumes, um, basically you're in a healthy state, um, which is good. Um, to, to give an example, in the UK, we did about 90 billion two years ago. Last year we only did 60 because of Brexit. And uh, in Q1, Germany has, has, has done, I think, double what's happened in the UK. So, the good thing about your region is you're rising. So. Um, 2015, the, the different colours is, is Q1, Q2, so you, you've really powered in. And I've, I've heard people talking um, that Poland might do 5 billion this year. So, so it is very encouraging. Um, more capital's coming. Um, but it is really a changing of the guard. Um, so, you know, in the past it's been very German institutional money, UK money, uh, and some US money. Um, and, and of course now we're seeing a lot more money coming from the Middle East, uh, coming on to South Africa, which I'm just about to touch on, uh, and of course Asia is growing. So it is, it is encouraging, um, you know, real estate is now a global uh, field. Um, we've got so much more new exotic capital, as I say, coming in from other regions. So it is encouraging. I've mentioned a bit um, on, on the Asians. I mean, everyone's talking about the Asians are coming here. And, you know, obviously what we've seen really so far is some of them doing it indirectly through the investment managers. Um, these figures get kind of distorted because of the GIC and the CIC deals of Logicor and, uh, and P3. Um, but, as I say, it is coming, and I've already highlighted that they have small teams, so they just don't have the uh, capacity to go and learn new markets. But the ones like the South Koreans um, who are uh, using investment managers will probably have more success. However, South Koreans always require 10 years uh, on leases. So, um, you know, maybe um, some of the developers here need to try and see if you can get longer leases to uh, get the premium pricing from the South Koreans. Um, and then I just really wanted to finish on uh, what's going on in South Africa, because obviously there's a huge wave of capital from South Africa um, coming over to Europe, um, and it's mainly coming to Central and Eastern Europe because of uh, the pricing. Um, some of it's gone into the UK, um, but nowhere near to, to the effect that's come over here. And I think, um, you know, why is it coming? And uh, I was speaking to my CEO in, uh, in Joburg the other, the other week, and, um, you know, he, he, he basically is saying that the RAND was doing really, really well uh, until Zuma, President Zuma, sacked Gordan, uh, the Ministry of Finance, and it had risen by 10% and was the actually the, the best currency performing in, in, in the world at the time last year. And then Gordon went and they lost 10%. It completely reversed within two weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a lot of volatility there. There's a lot of corruption. Um, the second picture here is uh, of the Guptas, uh, which is a family from India who have been living in South Africa since about 1993. Um, and they seem to 
be best friends with Zuma. And um, it's, it's been believed that the new finance minister who replaced Gordon uh, was appointed by the Guptas. And they're very corrupt. Uh, there's a lot of anger with them. They own a lot of the utility companies in South Africa. They own a lot of the mining companies. And considering they've only been there 20 years, they seem to be very well connected. And uh, there's a real feeling that they're sort of skimming billions of pounds out of the South African economy. Um, and then the final picture is the EFF, which is the Economic Freedom uh, Movement. Um, and uh, this is the new political party that was set up in 2013. Um, and it seems very corrupt itself. It feels that, um, that the current government, Zuma, and everyone has sold out the black people uh, to capitalism uh, for cheap labor, and they're very angry. And that movement is, is getting on. So I think those sort of three issues seem to be driving this capital out um, of South Africa from a political thing. I'm told that the next election is in 2019. Um, they, they may force it slightly earlier into 2018. And this is where President Zuma, who, who's obviously the head of the state, but he's also head of the leading part, party, and that's what they're hoping that they can get rid of him as head of the leading partner, bringing, bring in a new person who will be a bit more global and cause a bit more stability, and hopefully they can come out of recession. Um, but the reasons for uh, sort of, you know, the overseas property investment, um, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, they're very worried with the volatility of what's going on with the RAND. Um, you know, they've been graded by um, S&P and Fitch as junk status now. Um, there's a lot of political risk. Uh, there's a lot of corruption, as I've mentioned. Um, but they have a great affinity to real estate. Um, very like the Asians, uh, they, they understand real estate and it's performed very, very well. Um, and they want to come out and diversify and quite often they really lack scale in their markets. Um, so some, some of these pictures is, um, you know, there's very limited opportunities uh, for them in South Africa, very few good quality office logistics and shopping centers in South Africa. Um, and these guys want to come over and try and diversify into new markets where they feel they can get better covenants in terms of uh, better occupiers, bigger corporates, uh, better quality assets in a less political uh, um, environment and uh, you know, stronger economic outlook um, in, in, in the short term. Um, and um, yeah, basically, uh, you know, what have they been buying? We've been seeing a lot of the, the REITs coming, uh, the shopping centre REITs, and obviously we've seen them coming in and uh, buying quite a lot of shopping centres over here. But they're also going into offices. They like logistics. Uh, and as I say, they, they just feel that uh, Europe offers a better opportunity in the short term uh, than theirs. And, you know, there's a whole load. So we've always had the traditional investors like the life and pension funds, the likes of Investec have been over uh, for quite a while and Nepi have been here, but the recent wave, uh, as I mentioned, is the sort of listed real estate funds, developers and REITs, uh, and there's some of the names that are becoming household names over in this region.